Hi, I'm Chrissy Hall and I'm with director for Iron Newsnet and we're just going to have a little chit chat about uh, the industry and the future. Uh, so first of all, would you like to introduce yourself for anybody who's unfamiliar with your work? Um, I would say I'm Brian Usner and I am a horror filmmaker. Yeah. Um, so firstly, uh, as you began filmmaking when you were in your 30s, what advice would you give to young people who are interested in getting involved in the industry? Don't. <laughs> no, I think that you, I think it's very difficult. It's the kind of um, business that draws a lot of interest. Seems like a lot of fun, and it certainly can be. There's a lot of creativity that can be involved, and that draws a lot of people. And there's a lot of kind of glamour associated with the movie business. And all of this may, draws lots of people in, so the competition is fierce. The, there's a lot of technical parts of filmmaking that uh, are more technical. Everything has a creative element, but there's a technical parts of it that you can learn, you can be trained in, and you can um, work hard to try to get into a, onto a production and work your way up. Um, in that case, normally the, the, the system is you work for nothing at first. Uh, there's another way, which is you do your own projects. If you want to have the kind of um, higher, you know, the cooler jobs, the director, the um, director of photography, um, the, you know, the producer, um, you then are in a much different position because that's very hard to work your way up. And that's a much more complicated and risky business. Uh, usually on that level, you have to learn on your own. You have to make things on your own, do what you can. But I think when you make anything, whether it's in a, in a academic environment or if it's on your own, making a YouTube video or a short film with your friends or w whatever. I guess my main advice is take it very seriously. Be as professional as you can. Don't, don't be embarrassed just because you don't have any money and you don't have any professionals around. You should be professional. You should take it really seriously. Study films, study the genre that you're working in study how to do it, even if it's watching extras on DVDs, reading books. I think that, that one of the worst things you can do is kind of be kind of embarrassed to try to do it the right way. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so in a recent question and answer, building on what you just said, um, you said that you don't need any experience to start making things. Obviously, starting out can be quite overwhelming. Um, so in terms of the very, the very starting point, would you suggest to just, just start making things if it's what you're really interested in? Well, I think that you, you have plenty of time. If you're not, I mean, if you're not having to work 12 hours a day for a living, you probably have some time in the evenings or on weekends. I would say keep busy. And I, th I think, I mean, there's so many how-to stuff about filmmaking now, it's ridiculous, you know. Uh, when I began, there was maybe a few books, but it wasn't like, there was no extras on DVDs. There were no DVDs. The, and now the means of production are available to anybody. You can shoot a movie literally on your cell phone, yeah. HD and you can download Final Cut or one of the editing softwares. You can get a, you know, download the um, Pro Tools for sound. I mean, everything is within your grasp, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. And I think the more you learn about what you're doing, the better. The more you learn the craft, 
and I think that there's uh, there's a there's kind of a problem out there in in movie making that uh, that began in the 50s with the author theory of filmmaking that the film was a had value as a personal expression of the director and I think this has done a lot of um, done a lot of harm in general because it has people thinking that they're artists just because they make a short film and I think you should think in terms of being a craftsman and learn to learn the craft of whatever part of film you're you're doing and study the craft of it and try to do don't constantly be thinking that you're you should be doing some kind of a, a personal statement or pick something that is that is clearly definable as a goal and then practice you know okay cool yeah um so obviously uh your genre that you specialize in is horror um i'm interested to know how you think that that genre has changed um particularly compared to uh the reanimator film specifically bride of reanimator and beyond reanimator um in comparison to today's genres of horror and similar themes such as the kind of frankenstein-esque uh, themes within those films, how would you say that they've changed now? Obviously we've got higher uh, production values and stuff like that. Um, would you say it's changed significantly? The movie business has changed. Movies have changed. Horror movies have changed. They change. There's a development um, not only in the in the stories that are being told, in the acceptance of certain um, themes or tropes um, but also in the way the movies are financed and distributed. And I think that, that to understand movies, you have to understand financing and distribution. The business of movies is what makes movies the way they are. Yes, there's right now, for example, you could make a zombie movie. Everybody would get what you're doing, but back when Night of the Living Dead started it, it was a little different. Yeah. It was just becoming evolving. Now the zombie genre is like the Western genre used to be 50 years ago. So there is a development like that. And yes, movies always reflect the times. So when the, you know, in the 20s, when Lon Chaney was making his movies about deformed or people with missing legs or arms. A lot of that was based on the aftermath of World War I when a lot of people came back from, from the war without limbs. And this was something society was seeing. So the movies always reflect society and there is a development in the genres based on what came before. So Reanimator had its it, its, its nature was based a lot on what the filmmakers liked when they were kids. So you have these influences. From a business perspective, Reanimator was based on the fact that there was a video revolution going on, that movies now um, could make money, they could be financed by the video sales. And in the early 80s, anybody could get into video. The video stores were mom and what we call mom and pop shops. They were, in, they were independent stores. The means of exhibition was paid for by the consumer. They bought the machine. And the studios didn't believe in it, so they didn't get in right away. So all that conspired to make the 80s a time where young people could go make a movie and the people financing it weren't all that organized. There were startups, in the equivalent to internet startups, say 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Now, well, during the 80s, this started, it started monopolizing. In the 90s, Blockbuster ran everything. The studios came into the video business. All the little companies went bust. And you'll see the movies starting to follow more of a corporate 
direction, not because, just by virtue of the fact that you have a different type of entity dis determining it. Something like Reanimator, I paid for that. I borrowed the money. I paid for it. Well, nobody was telling us what to do. I did what I wanted to do. I didn't want to take. I didn't take it to the MPAA for a rating because I thought, well, they're just going to cut out all the good stuff. So I didn't have to because I had nobody to answer to. Once when I did Bride of Reanimator or Society, that was financed by Japanese investors. They didn't say what to do. They just gave you the money. By the time you come around to um, Beyond Reanimator, I was then doing, I made a label, a production line in Spain called the Fantastic Factory. Now it was a little different. I had a company. We wanted an, probably an R rating. The company was Spanish. We were getting Spanish subsidies. So therefore we had to put lots of Spanish actors. The crews had to be Spanish. We had to shoot it there, although we were doing English. So now you have actors acting in a language that's not theirs. Can't bring too many people over. Just brought Jeffrey Combs. Um, and now, it's in, now the company kind of has to understand what you're doing. So now, of course, that movie will have a different character than the movie that I just paid for in L.A. with a bunch of horror fans, with a bunch of horror fans who were working in the movies. So that affects how the movies are made. Right now, the horror industry is based on, well, first of all, the movie industry, since the, the, um, the last 15 years, as the internet became more and more powerful, um, it's starting to have the same effect that the music business had much earlier, which was that anybody could get on it. The delivery system that could be pirated very easily, and everybody expects to get everything for nothing. The other side of it is that the, that the um, movies become much easier to make because they're uh, these high and HD cameras, God, they work on, in incredibly low, they work in no light levels. So now people don't need to, to um, light much. And they don't even need a director of photography because what they see is what they get. So this starts making it so that there's so much content out there. There's so much free stuff. There's so much on the internet to watch that you don't go to the movies anymore except to see huge, big blockbusters. And on the lower end, you have thousands of people making their little short movie and often with their uncle's money yeah. or their money. And you can make a movie for, I mean, we all know the stories of movies that are made for 15 grand and, and, and made money. But of course, they were you know, those th they were for that one movie that cost 15,000 and made a ton of money, there's 15,000 movies that never made a dollar. Yeah. And this is a, so this is part of what has changed the movies we see. And then the other side of it is that because the way people make movies now is so, let's say, easy to shoot, you don't really have to light, well, now the lighting doesn't tell a story. If you start, if you can shoot in, in, in a location, because you don't want to build a set, it's too expensive. So you go to a location. Used to be the camera was very big. You had to bring lights in there, made the location very awkward. Well, now it's very easy to go to location. You've already got your set. You don't need, you don't have a big camera may not even need hardly any lights. So the lighting you get is what you see. If you start on a dark stage, a sound stage, and you build the set, how you design the set becomes part of your story. That's part of what you're doing. Lighting it, you're starting from black, now you're bringing in lights. How you light it is a point of view. How you move, the, so all those stages, those steps 
make for a make for creative decisions that we don't see much in the movies today yeah. because we just see they just run you run around with the camera you see what you get and so that has changed the nature the type of horror movies we make i'm not sure why they tend to be so much the same all of them it seems like there's much less censorship but what we get from no censorship is more and more grisly pain as though that is and on the other hand we have all this pc culture built into us where everybody's afraid to be transgressive and i think back to the like 80s and i think well the fun of horror movies is when they're transgressive when they surprise you when they cross over lines and that's what i find is a little bit missing today okay um so taking it back to what you were saying about the internet and uh, Netflix and how that compared to the music industry, particularly with piracy. Um, but with Netflix, we're currently in the midst of this age uh, where streaming services are making it incredibly easy to access films uh, and much more. Uh, but now these services are creating content, such as films and TV programmes. How do you think this is going to change the relationship between filmmakers and distributors, such as Netflix and uh, other streaming services? I don't think it's going to change it at all. I think it's always been like that. And that you've always had people who are independent and they make something. If they can get it on Netflix, they think they've been successful. Um, it used to be that if they could get it into Blockbuster, they got successful or if they got it at the drive-in, it was successful. The, the, um, some people starting out, they just want people to see their movies. So they'll go to, they'll get on their social network, they'll get on, they'll go to festivals and they'll have fans and they might have, um, they'll feel very successful except they won't be making any money. And if you want to be a professional filmmaker, the definition of being professional is that you make money at it. If you don't make money, it's a hobby, which is fine too. But also even people who make a hobby, you'd like people to see it. And if you don't get distribution, you don't have an audience. And I think most people, even if they're independently wealthy, they want people to, to watch, they, they want the audience. The, um, the, Netflix is got into production because I mean they, Netflix was like the equivalent of of Blockbuster in the sense that everybody was trying to do streaming video but Netflix was there when finally the broadband the bandwidth got big enough to handle it now the problem is that everything's free pretty much and then um, the the subscription services like Netflix have a limit and VOD, anybody can have a VOD channel. You could start a VOD channel right now and get the same movies that you get on VOD from Amazon, from Hulu, from anybody, the VOD ones, pay-per-view, because that's all goes through the company that, I mean, the deal's the same for everybody. Maybe you won't get as much of a cut as, the, as Hulu does, but you can do it. So anybody can do that. Subscription services are normally not exclusive. So when Netflix gets all the old Mario Bava movies, it's not exclusive. They, they, you may be able to give it to another, um, uh, another subscription service. What they have to do to distinguish themselves is to have original programming. And so now you see that iTunes and all these other Amazon's making their own individual, their own original programming. This, I think, is because finally, after, since the death of DVD, now Blu-ray exists as a collector's medium, or for the really big blockbusters, there's still some, you know, there's still DVD business. But in general, it's a collector's item. It's kind of like you quit seeing all the big bookstores they're all closing down but Tashin books is still around why because they sell you the book that you want to own to put on the coffee table the big glossy photos and that type of thing and that's kind of dvds and blu-rays are for people who are 
who are really lovers of cinema and who really want to have the extras and all that. But people who just want to watch a movie, they could care less about that stuff. So all these delivery systems become more and more ubiquitous and for any company to get you to go to them to do your business, they need to have a brand. They have to have stuff that they, that they produce that identifies them as the place to go. This, this, all these years where the bandwidth was getting bigger and the DVDs were dying led to kind of this weird time when there was no financing for independent movies. And the people who were making them were doing it on their own, on their own nickel. The, the, right now it seems like there's, finally there's, it's hit a critical mass where the VOD, the SVOD, what they call over the top delivery systems, all those electronic delivery services are now starting to, to kind of get to a point where, there, where it's, it will be profitable the way DVD was. And this has taken time and lots of what's happening, for example, is if you sell your movie to Europe, you may have to sell it to all of Europe, not Spain, France, Italy. Just like in the 50s in the United States, the 40s and 50s, you might sell your movie to each state. Then it's, well, the country's big. Then you, when you're, you're, then when you sell to France, you sell to all Spanish, all French-speaking territories. Well, what's happening now in the EU is that it's you'll be probably selling those rights to a pan to all EU. So this is a different world, and if you don't, and so now these big companies see that they need product for that, and you're, I'm starting to. You know, all of a sudden, all these, all, all these um, um, b companies, uh, I get the feeling there's now an opening doors for, for needing original productions. If you don't have a brand name, if you're not known, it makes it tough because you're just, you make a movie, it's hard to get. The hardest thing is to sell your movie after you made it if you don't have a partner that's a distributor. Because the, mov the movie will die if it doesn't get out there, if it doesn't get promoted. So really you want to have the company that's going to distribute it be involved from the beginning, be part of the financing. They've bought in. If you're not known to them, if you don't have any track record, well, how are you going to, how could you do that? So there, that's where, you know, I think that Catch-22 has always been a part of the movie business and I think a lot of other businesses. Okay, well thank you for sitting down with us and you've given some great advice. I loved everything you said. So thank you. Thank you.